love that name of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. Last weekend we were celebrating. Well, some of us were up in Elgin, beautiful Scotland, celebrating Easter together. We had a great time up there. Some of the testimonies were being told to me before this, but um, I thought up there and other times of those remarkable moments on the cross that often we don't talk about too much. But those wonderful moments of deliverance and freedom and all that came. But uh, I love that moment on the cross when, uh, Naomi, you made it good. <laughs> uh, we've been looking for you. So uh, that moment on the cross when Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, was one of the most remarkable moments in history, really. Because at the time, they had to open the door for mercy to triumph over judgment. But at that moment, our creator God had every right to wipe out civilization. They hung the savior of the universe on the cross. They were guilty of murder. And by the very law, they should have been put to death. But instead, a remarkable thing happened. Because in the Old Testament, they had, when someone committed murder, there was an accuser sent after them to put them to death. And they would chase them across the countryside, officially, to hunt them down and kill them because they committed murder. But what was going to happen if someone just accidentally killed somebody? What was the provision to protect them from the accuser? It's a remarkable thing, really. Well, what they, God put into the earth were these little places around the land that were called cities of refuge. And if you could flee into them and you committed accidental death, you were free from the accuser and safe. So on that moment on the cross, Jesus declares with this voice, I choose this to be held against them as accidental death, not as murder. And I will open up myself to become a city of refuge that if they will flee into me, the accuser of the brethren can never get them. What a safe place to live. A lot happened on the cross. That was one of the wonderful moments. Foundational for us in the sense of the grace and where we live. But another wonderful thing that's very foundational in Cotton's life, in our life, was also what happened on the cross that day when the weight of sin was upon him, the sin of the world. His body was beaten, broken, smashed. He carried a cross up a lonely path while they were beating him. The devil had crowned him with the curse of the law, uh, the, the curse of the fall, uh, with the crown of thorns. The earth had never given grown thorns until after the fall. And so when the devil tried to crown him artificially as king, they crowned him with the fruit of the curse. And as they hammered it onto his head that day, that's what that blood cried out, we're free from the curse. Four times that Jesus bled on the way and on the cross. But on that, with all that weight upon him and all the incredible happening on his uh, body, and right, he looks down and he says a remarkable thing. He says, Mum, John, this is your son. John, this is your mother. Obviously, Joseph's off the scene by now. And he said, from that day on, Mary moved in with John. That he could not even die without establishing into the kingdom that was come and his glorious church, that taking care of family would be the very foundation of it. Wouldn't be structures. Wouldn't be religion. It'd be mum, your son. That's why we do a lot around fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and mothers and sons. It's brilliant what he did on the cross, isn't it? But then there was a moment that was probably even greater than all of that. Faith friends and would often teach and preach over the years that everything Jesus lost on the cross and on the way, uh, uh, on the way to the cross, he wants back in his people on earth. He became poor that we could be rich. He became wounded that we could be healed. All the wonderful truths of that. But one thing that's not very often said, and I, I can't get my head around it theologically, although I've preached on it for 30 years. 
But there was this moment when all of history, all of everything just seemed to stand still. And a cry came out of his heart. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? And he became fatherless for a second so we could become fathered. What a moment. So the only begotten son could become the firstborn of many. And here we are. No wonder we don't fret much. (laughs) A little bit, not much. It's a wonderful thing. And yeah, here we are at the probably greatest moment of history, obviously, every year probably is, but this one is a wonderful moment in history, of course, and good for us. Church of the Nations this year is 45 years old, since the official start at least, and a few more years if we uh, go back to Milford days, but 45 years old, and I turned 77, so I'm twice perfection now. (laughs) My dear wife here, 60 years since she woke up to the fact that I was going to be the man in her life at the ripe old age of 14, and we've been together ever since. 60 years this year. So we, a lot of celebration for us. But this year is going to be a lot bigger stuff going on in the earth. You realize this year, over 4 billion people are going to vote this year for the change of leadership in their nations. The most ever in history, and the most ever, it's a strategic global time and as Church of the Nations of course we are not very localized are we we are for the nations most incredible thing the most ever the world will change this year nations will change probably in a nation like this we'll go through a a change that hasn't happened for how how many years since we've had a, a Labour Prime Minister 16 more years I think so most likely here Uh, there will be a change. We don't know for sure yet, but if all polls are anything even close, it would be around, you know. So America, South Africa, nations of the world, one nation going to the polls this year have one billion people that will be voting in India itself and probably the most strategic election India's ever had with a nation that's pushing to get Christianity right out of the nation at the moment. So we're in this wonderful moment A lot to celebrate, a lot to rejoice in, a lot to be challenged by. So I got asked tonight to talk about a little bit about the history of cotton, where we got to this like we did in South Africa a year ago, but also how naturally supernatural filtered through all of that. So the next two or three hours, that's what we're going to share on. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This is my last shot. This is my only shot. So this is it. two years before we have another Northern Hemisphere one, so uh, yeah. anyhow, no, it won't be like that, but uh, it is a wonderful opportunity. I, I'm always excited. What, what people, I, I'm the optimist, you know, but what people always, often will say, if the kingdom is advancing and we're winning, why is things looking so bad? Well, that's not a very complicated answer, is it? Because Isaiah prophesied it. He said, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Kings and rulers will come to the brightness of your rising. And at the same time, darkness and deep darkness will cover the earth. An increase in darkness is not a testimony the kingdom's not advancing. It's rather proof that it is. So don't, light always shines brighter in the darkness if we don't get smothered up and covered up in the darkness. And so we should rejoice. We should be expectant. And, uh, we're enjoying probably in many ways one of the best seasons of our lives in all kinds of ways, although the last three months have been some of the most traumatic we've ever walked through in our lives. But at the same time, there's something rising on the earth. So where did it start for us? What is it about? What do we really talk about? And uh, just look a little bit at that tonight, not going in the same way that they're working in with the supernatural. We so-called officially started what became the Church of the Nations family Uh, Here in England, we're an English-born network of churches down in the town in the south in a place called Crawley in Sussex, uh, where we officially went in 1979. And uh, in 1979, uh, it was the result of a number of things that are supernatural 
that had begun to take place. So where does that all fit together and how do we live naturally, supernaturally and all of that? I'll share a bit. But God had very supernaturally began to work in some circumstances way beyond. Mara and I had arrived in England a little while before after being excommunicated to hell from the movement that we were connected with in Australia uh, because we believed evangelism was therapeutic. And as we left, they looked at us in the eyes and said to us, if you go to England now, because they called all their missionaries back from around the world and everything, they closed in and they said, if you go to England, nothing but failure will follow you the rest of your life. And so we arrived in London, Marilyn and I, two, uh, two daughters in our arms, two suitcases, $200 to our name, I think, and about a team of about 10 people. Not an earth knowing even if we were even saved still. We were a mess. We ended up with friends where we went to and eventually just to keep ourselves sane, we would drive from Nottingham every Friday night in a little Volkswagen Beetle, three or four of us, to end up in the west end of London in Piccadilly Circus and start walking the streets to pick up drug addicts that were overdosing till the ambulances could come and get them. Just so we could do something. We were desperate to find out. And we didn't know where we were, what was happening, what was going on, until a moment happened. And in that town where we were in a drug rehabilitation center, up in the Midlands of England, outside Nottingham, a conference was held on this place. And we were desperately trying to get an answer to where, what this is all about. Are we in rebellion? Are we saved? <laughs> Is this any kind of reality in this? I mean, it was tough going. And uh, I felt God just speak to me this night and say, your answer is going to be the man who's going to speak at this conference. And then one of the girls on the team with us came running up to us and said, I had a dream last night of a man who's going to be in that tent. And he's got the answer for us. I mean, it was like we were desperate. We walked into the tent that next morning and something happened because as soon as the guest speaker, I was just helping the administration put the chairs out and all the stuff you do in the tent and this man walked in to speak <clears throat> and I knew he was the one. Then the girl come running down the aisle to us who was on the team with us said, that's the man I saw in the dream last night and we'd never seen him. So you can't live and move in God without the supernatural naturally happening and that's what I want to enlarge on before we get out of today and release some of you into a fresh stage of it in your lives it was like if it hadn't been for that so I went up to the man after and he was a man in the body of Christ a mission leader and um, I went up to him and said look you don't know me but we're desperate this is our story and he just looked at me and said I don't know but he said this, I'll contact our ministry globally and for the next six hours we'll pray globally for you that we, you find an answer and anything I need to know, the intercessors will call us back. So we went. And the next day we go to the conference again and he comes up and he says to me, we believe that you're not insane, not in rebellion, that there's been an incredible attack and... We believe with the intercessors that God is going to show you the way through and I, you need to meet a man. So I said, okay, where? He said, well, this man is, leads a mission organization, become a close friend of mine and still is today. But he said he leads it in England and he said he's always going somewhere so he's going to be at Heathrow Airport for one hour tomorrow. And he said if we can get down there from Nottingham, we can talk. So we go to the leader of the... Now he's a guest speaker at this conference. So he goes to speak at this, um, uh, to this man and says, look, you know Tony, you're walking with him in Marilyn and that, but we've got to find an answer and I think the door might have opened. Will you excuse me from the conference so I can take him to London? And he was the main speaker of the conference. And the guy said, and this is where relationships come into all this, he said, more important for Tony Marin to find an answer to this question 
then for us to have another session at a conference. So we can cover that, you take him. So we went down and met this man who's become my friend. <laughs> He's spoken at a conference with us before now. And we spent that hour and he invited us to come down and be with them. And that started three years of healing and restoration of getting our lives remade. It took four years, 1975 to 79. And in that time, we ended up taking a team because a wonderful lady who just passed away a few weeks ago after all this time being with us, a wonderful lady called Sheila Jones from Milford Haven, came down to this YWAM base in Crawley and said, the Walsh Revival, Miss Wales, Miss Milford Haven at least, not all of them, <laughs> Miss Milford Haven, the charismatic movement has missed us, and we're a group of believers there that need help. So will you send a team to look it out? And so Lynn looked at us and said, you guys are a team hanging out with us now, we'll send you. You go. So make a long story there short, we went for a two-week outreach and Mara and I ended up staying there mostly two years in and out. And uh, one of the very first young girls in the grammar school who ended up giving her life really over to the Lord were amongst another, uh, got saved and we had this little move of God amongst this little group of kids. And one of them, Sarah, is here tonight, right out of that situation and still in the church there in Milford Haven. But it was just something that began to happen out of our control. I was not raised in the supernatural. I was not raised in a denomination that even believed in it. Well, they did in the beginning days, but not now where we were. And so all of it was new and we were finding our way through it all. But through that, something incredible happened. Because there was a conference happened, a leaders conference for that organization. And I went there and this leader, who I just knew kind of just very briefly from Australia days, but a man called Lauren Cunningham, who also passed away in the last 12 months. But Lauren stood there, Lynn took me there, and we talked. We stood in the ground, and he shared his heart. Asked me every question you could imagine, gave me the third degree, went through it all, and I said, Lauren, I, you know, I need to find an answer to this. Are we hearing God's will, or have we missed it? And if we have missed it, what's going to, you know, what do we do? You know, we don't know what to do. And Lauren listened to the whole story, and the man who had excommunicated us to hell in Australia, uh, well, him and others, he, they said, wrote to every leader in the body of Christ they knew, which was substantial, all around the world, wrote them a letter, and said, if you have anything to do with Tony Fitzgerald from this day on, you can no longer have anything to do with us. So we're living under this, leaders all around. So when I'm talking to Lauren, I said, Lauren, did you get your letter? He said, not yet, I've been traveling. <laughs> is there one coming? I said, yeah, there is. It's in the, in your, in the mail, <laughs> you know. It's in the mail. Told him what was going on. And it was the first time, really, in my life that supernaturally I touched outside my own natural dad one or two other things on the way through an Anglican vicar and some others. But I touched the Father heart of God because he reached out, wrapped his arms around me and held me. I've held a lot of people since that hold because I believe sometimes there's more healing in a hug than there is in a sermon. And he held me that day and said, it's okay, whatever comes, we believe you're right, you're free, and we're going to stand with you. So he went back and his letter was waiting for him. So he wrote back to these people and said, I've been with Tony, we've been this, we've been through all the thing. And he simply said then, if it means you no longer have anything to do with, with us as a mission, and the church in its days was the main entrance for YWAM into Australia. He said, if you have nothing um, to do with us anymore because of that, we will stand with Tony. And today, here we are, that movement's come to naught, no longer in existence, and here we are, because of a hug and an acceptance and a supernatural moment that you couldn't write about. You either live in them, you walk with them, but it's naturally supernatural. Didn't take three days of prayer and fasting for it to happen. 
See, we're still a people that often look that this is going to happen in meetings or things, but that's not what we talk about when we live, talk about living the spirit life. Amen? So the history began there in that situation, and the rest is history now, I guess. But, you know, then we started to move through the decades, which we're not going to hang a long time on today. But how, how did that happen? Well, in 1969 came the real final uh, call for Marilyn and I to move. And uh, so we, we got married on the first day of 1970, and in that decade went through all that we've gone through, led us to the UK, and the birth then in 79 to start the next decade of what eventually became the Church of the Nations family. We were raw, very raw. We were dependent a lot on grace. You know, um, I, I couldn't go through that whole story. It would be wrong and too many people would have to talk. But we needed a lot of grace. And God worked us through all those kinds of things until we got to the place. We started the little church on the YOM base and then started Mason. And I, I was thinking of uh, Darren Eagles today because Darren's over here with his wife Ruth. Darren is probably the longest standing elder in Church of the Nations globally. Because <laughs> that is true, right? Take a bow, Darren. It's true because when Stephen and Anita went to, Anita, uh, went to Mason to start the church, basically you guys either got fully right with God or met the Lord through what was going on there or whatever. You weren't married then. And then all that happened, and pretty soon you were in eldership and that with Stephen. Here you are still at Mason in the church and as an elder. And Stephen is here, Stephen Herzig and Anita. Stephen came and joined himself with us four years before we, 79, back in 75, 76 somewhere. So it was with us in Milford Haven as well. So right there is a lot of history of where we've traveled. But that decade happened and we went through. And every decade, starting on the nines, ready for the next decade, probably for me more than a lot of the other leaders in cotton, it became a very significant thing to walk into those, um, to walk in those decades. And so the first one in 1979 we started. Then in 1989, 10 years later, we had a conference in Bognor Regis. Some of you were there, but in Bognor Regis. And in Bognor Regis, a song called The Anthem of the Nations or Church of the Nations was written and we'd sing it out with flags coming in down the hallways and the aisles and things and then you thought we'd thump it out. And we'd come forward because we decided at that time we would come under the name Church of the Nations. Up to then we were known all different names. We were Abundant Life Ministries, New Creation in um, South Africa, because South Africa had started by then and all the things that happened. But it was just a series of supernatural events that were taking place, way beyond anything we could imagine. I mean, you imagine this, how South Africa got underway with us, for those from South Africa. There was a man called Ron Robertson, who's... Uh, was one of the first leaders in our family and a part of the original apostolic few <laughs> as we were. And Ron heard a message in Johannesburg one night preached by a man called Larry Tomczak of rediscovering, finding church in a whole new way. And he was working in a carpet business floor, carpet business, and him and Anne felt with one of the two kids at that stage, one I think, I can't remember, to set out on only, only Kimmy. So they set out on a journey to travel to find what is this new way. They came to America, hired a van, traveled from coast to coast, went to all the Meccas, big things through Tulsa, through all the things where planes were flying in those days. But someone had said to him before he left South Africa, which has to be supernatural because we were nobodies doing nothing really, said, you're not going to find your answer till you meet a guy called Tony Fitzgerald in the UK. We have one little church of about 20 or 30 people. But somehow this guy knew something of the values that we were beginning to wrestle with. So we went through all those, eventually arrived in England and arrived at a little pizza shop where we were doing men's meetings in the morning and he walked in. And the rest is history there. Him and Marilyn, him and... Uh, and moved in with Marilyn and I in the house, and it was a big house, YWAM base house. Matt Redmond's 
wife was there as well. She was one year old. And so it was early <laughs> day. Literally, she was one year old. She said to me one day, she remember, Tony, you probably don't remember, but I lived in the house with you when I was one, my dad and mum told me. So um, anyhow, they, this happened and they went back and said, when you, we get back and we get one other couple convinced, <laughs> we'll send for you. So weeks went by, then Ron contacted us and said, there's another couple joined us, we're flying you down. And we went down. So green, so naive. God provided all the stuff that had to be there to get us there and I remember we were driving through Randburg in South Africa and there was these big posters up on the signs and it said come and hear Tony Fitzgerald on Saturday seminar he's going to be speaking on apostles and prophets I looked at Marilyn and said who are they what are they we better find we better find something quick we're going to have a we've got to teach a seminar on Saturday on this we had a rough idea but not much so that's how it all just started to get carved out you know the stories but with it came this whole supernatural um, journey. The power of God began to move mightily. We began to see miracles happen. We began to see things that were just, I mean, they started in Milford and places that was all building up. But down there in South Africa, you know, we just saw things like I very rarely have seen since. Dave Cape often reminds me of the night we were out on a farm about halfway out to Sun City, from Joburg, and we're in there. And there's about hundred of us packed in this big room, I guess. And demons are coming out everywhere. I mean, demons coming about everywhere. People on the floor, up the wall, everywhere. I mean, demons are coming out. And then all of a sudden, you know what's like in South Africa when storms come up. When storms come up, they really come up. So all the windows are open, and the noise of this wind that was blowing through. And everyone raced over to shut the windows and then stop because the drapes weren't moving. There was no wind, just the sound of a mighty rushing one. I mean, I'll never forget that night. As demons are leaving, you could hear the wind roaring, but there's no wind. Goosebump stuff, really. I mean, we were, what I'm trying to say to you, embedded into our very foundations is what we're talking about over this weekend and others are going to take you into over the next few day and a half. So in 89, there was that Bognor Regis. 99, now we're Church of the Nations for a decade and the team is forming. John's with us by then and others, we're pretty well formed, similar to what we are now really. And we spent a week in Westminster Central Hall in London in the basement there, some others had joined us. And as we were praying, we were asking one important question. What was this? Could we build something globally and build with a flat top, not a point, that wouldn't come back to one person, wouldn't come back to the devil's only got to knock one person off and the whole thing falls kind of thing, that there'd be a flat top. Is it possible to build a flat top and still tough, touch the world? And so it was in that that God began to unpack it through someone else into us, the whole thing that became family, clan, tribe, and nation. And we embraced uh, a way that, not Hebrew mentality in that, but the way that God set the Hebrew nation up from being family, clan, tribe, and nation. We changed the world, word from clan to cluster, uh, just because, especially in America, it's a better word. And um, so we, we went from family, clan, tribe and nation, especially when it's a kingdom clan, KK, you know, you haven't got far to go then. So cluster was much better. And so we changed it to cluster, and, uh, which was like a cluster of grapes. And um, we began to embrace that way. So we knew it was going to cost us in some ways because a lot of people are looking for one-man-led situations and uh, attracted to one-person ministries and things and everyone has their own journey. But, but I wanted and we felt we needed to build that flat top. So what became then was this whole basic thing of family, clan, tribe and nation, building a flat top, multiplying at every level. Right through to 2009, when this conference with others were in Plymouth in the UK, and uh, we had the full shift of government at that point up to 2009, our 
logo, if you want, or mission statement was building a family of churches reaching the nations. And in that meeting, it changed in print and everywhere from then on to be a family of apostolic clusters advancing the kingdom. And so we were going to multiply not just at church level, not just as, you know, through, but at every level through we would try to multiply where today where we've come to is that we are five apostolic networks within the family under the umbrella of Church of the Nations, all with their apostolic leadership, all building their teams, and the government rests of Church of the Nations in the clusters no longer in an apostolic council. We're simply there uh, to be there as a safeguard, a council, and that kind of thing, often more a council than a council, and uh, to be in that kind of situation. So that multiplication factor went into being then. And then in 2019, the most recent one, every cluster, if the decades were going to mean anything to them, would have their own. But for me and for us and what we were in the connected cluster, we moved to what we really understood to be, this kind of sounds maybe a bit radical if it's not in your vocabulary kind of thing, but where we'd reason the church from the kingdom, not the kingdom from the church. That became the final big transition for us of where we're building through. In other words, when all this started, God didn't give the church a mission. He gave the mission a church. Amen? When he gave the mission to go into all the world, the mission was very clearly outlined. But every time that mission begins to move and things begin to happen, then the community of believers have to form that we call the wonderful church, people call it the local church, whatever, the ecclesia, or whatever it is. But the mission was to bring the kingdom to the whole world. And then by what Jesus said, if you go, when you go, you go preach the gospel of the kingdom, and I will build my church. And we embrace that, and we live in that now, cluster-wise. Other clusters might see it slightly different, live that. That's the wonderful thing of diversity of freedom to be able to move. So that's what took us through to the place where we are now. So if you're a part of Church of the Nations family globally now, you're living your life out under apostolic team in a cluster life, and the government of Church of the Nations moves forward. People ask sometimes, how will Church of the Nations go forward if that's what the council is? Well, it can only go forward at the strength of clusters go forward. So if you really want to know how we're going to go further ahead and move further ahead, the first question you've got to ask with your cluster life and team is how are we moving forward? But together, because of that family relationship that I mentioned about, becomes the very heart of, uh, of the life of what it's about. And when we were in South Africa last year, I'm not going to put it up today, but we were talking about this to move forward and I looked out the window there at Harvest Church and the window frame like that. As I looked through the window, there was this tree, a beautiful tree. And this tree was there. And as I looked at it, I just felt the Lord say to me, that is it. So I took the people, the Apostolic Council, others that were with us. We went outside, circled the tree and prayed because here was this remarkable tree if you ever go to harvest it stands there well it's still there but it was framed like a, a picture for me as I looked at it and here was this whole rough bottom to it where the roots went down and that was like us the values of what we all build on in every one of the clusters but coming out of that trunk that basic trunk where all the values were were five strong branches going up and out of every one of those branches, more branches, out to the leaves, right out in the distance, ministries, churches, right out there, but they're all linked right back to the same absolute value foundation base. And I just felt in my heart at that moment, that's it, for me at least, it's done. That's where we are. Now that picture's going to change as things develop and grows along, of course. There may be more branches in the tree as it continues to go. But it became that way uh, very clear in, in that tree situation. And so the miraculous of God in the way that he led and has taken us with a lot of pain, a lot of things over, over the years, 
I think has brought us to a place where it's unlimited where God can take you. Absolutely unlimited. You can dream your dream and there should be a place in the Cotton family, in the class you're involved in or wherever it is God wants you to be, to fulfill that dream. There's a dad somewhere that will hold you in his arms and hold you and say, go for it. I believe in you. And if you've got apostolic and prophetic dads around your life and you have someone believing in you and you link with spiritual dads and fathers and you're moving forward, that, it's unlimited what God can do. Because with a flat top, there's room for everybody to rise. You see, that's what family's really all about. There's no limitation uh, to where we can go and what can happen. See, this theme, as it fills through a conference like this, that we've got to emphasize a very basic truth if you want to live naturally supernatural. And that is simply this. If you ask a lot of Christians, who are you? What makes you up? They'll say we body, soul, and spirit. But the Bible never says you are. The Bible says you're spirit, soul, and body. That is the missing thing in Western Christianity. You're not a person, a Christian, living in a natural world that on Sunday gets together for a spiritual experience. If that's it, you've missed it by a thousand miles. You are a spirit that has a soul and lives in a body, thank God, because what a risk God would take if he didn't give us the body to hold us in a little bit. If you were just all running loose out there, that would be pretty wild. One day it might be like that. But can you, we spirit, soul, and body. So when your spirit, soul, and body, the most natural thing in the world to you is to do spiritual things. Naturally. How did that phrase come about? Well, in 1974, when I was back in the, in the end of the Jesus people movement, arrived in England for the first time, denims, Jesus stickers all over us, a bit bigger beard and, and a lot of hair. Um, I went to see a man... And this man was the leader in the Salvation Army of the whole social work internationally, a man called Colonel McAllister. And I wanted to see him because there was something about what I knew about this man. So I went in to see him, and I was sitting in his office in London, up in Judd Street or somewhere like that, or maybe in the headquarters, I can't remember where it was. But I went in to see him, and I'm sitting there, and I look across the table. He says, Tony, why, why, why are you thinking about England, and what is it on your heart? And I remember looking at him and telling him what I thought, and he leaned across the table, this man, a beautiful colonel in the, in the Salvation Army, a doctor of medicine, a psychiatrist, a tongue-speaking believer. And I, he leaned across the table at me. He looked me straight in the eyes, and he said, Tony... You can never accomplish your destiny in life until you learn how to live naturally supernatural. That's where it came from. Many people have preached it, written books after I've taught it somewhere, all kinds of things, but that's where the phrase came from. Now, that wonderful Salvation Army man back in 1974. And I never forgot that. I said, what does it mean to do it naturally? And one of the things I had to understand eventually was that God had never done a supernatural thing in his life, like Mike was saying. Everything he ever did was just natural to him. And I had to make a decision in my life, like you do in yours, are you going to try to bring God down to your level or live out of where he's lifted you up to in his? That's the only choice you have in this. You see? People say, oh, I don't believe in the miracles. I don't believe in the supernatural. You know, I'm a Christian. I say, no, you're not. I have no problem saying it straight. You cannot be a Christian and not believe in miracles. You're not a Christian unless Jesus rose from the dead. And if he did, that's a miracle. If you can believe that one, the rest are easy. <laughs> Time we told it like it was. But this whole life began to be the very foundation all through these years. And through... What is it to live 
in the spirit. I want to say a couple of things to you on it tonight before we wind out. But the key, we are spirit that has a soul, lives in a body. I told you some of the stories when we had a little revival up near Nottingham. I saw things we'd never seen. We'd sit in the house every night. People would drive 60, 70 miles, unknown. We'd never met them, never seen them. God would just speak to them. They'd drive into Newark, New Jer- uh, Newark uh, um, up in Nottinghamshire, and they would arrive, knock on the door, and they'd say, is this where you get filled with the spirit? We'd say, yes. They were lining up like it was a doctor's surgery. We never met them. They'd driven 50, 60, 70 miles. They'd come in, we'd pray for them, they'd go out, drive home again. Was that us? Uh, well, I guess it was us, but, you know, it was like... I've seen things that could never happen in the normal. We don't have to wait in meetings. It's there all the time around us. It's how you see it. Do you see yourself as a spirit living in a soul, uh, living with a soul in a body, or do you see yourself as a natural man in a body that has spiritual experiences? If you do, it's not going to change. You're going to be a Sunday morning, go to church kind of believer, be of good character through the week, but nothing's going to shift through your life much. But if you want to live it naturally out there, somehow that's what... You know, you've got to get touched by something. And the presence, and and it's got to open your eyes to see. I'm not a feely kind of person. I can be in meetings if John's ministering and everyone gets zapped except me. I can pray for people, 30 at a prayer line, go down the whole line, see them get miracles, and get to the end and wonder, oh, how come I didn't get anything? I can be in a room like this and the Holy Spirit's moving. I can be sitting there. One, God, why did you jump over everybody? You know, you hit everyone else and jumped over me. Because I've never got it in the emotions and feelings so much. Some people get it like that all the time. They're just wide receivers, you know, in American football. You look for them. That's how supernatural ministries operate from the front in buildings. You look for them. You play, you don't play your crowd. But you feel it. Fake it till you make it a little bit. You know, have you ever watched healing ministries? They nearly always start with headaches before they raise the dead. <laughs> you can't miss that word. Someone here has had a headache today. I believe God, yeah, sure it'll be a hand go up. Pretty safe, builds faith, and you move to the next level. I'm teasing a bit. <laughs> but it's, it's what goes on. You, know, you, you, you feel it, you start to move it. But in the natural, when you're just out there walking the streets or you at your place of employment. You don't have all that. Just have you. What are the gifts of the spirit? The, the Corinthian ones. They're like to the spirit man, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, those ones, you know, discerning the spirits, etc. They're like to your spiritual man what feel, touch, smell are to your natural man. They're like the senses of the spirit. So you live with that all the time in your life. That's why when you walk through, you see something, you speak it, you say it, you feel it. In the natural, you can feel it, but in the spirit, it's the same kind of way. And it's that life, that supernatural life, that God wants to bring us into. You know, how did the Mason Church initially start? You know it started? Because we had an outreach in, in Ashford in Kent, where for 21 nights in a row, we slept in tents and preached in a tent. Got so much, we'd have a baptismal tank set up in the front. People would come from the city of London, come to the meeting, we'd preach, they'd run forward in their pinstripe suits and jump into the baptismal tank, literally, as they're getting saved. Every night. It was crazy. I remember a night, a girl in the front row sitting there, crutches, leg all bandaged up. What's wrong with you? you? Oh, well, I tried on broken glass. I had to have 30 stitches or something down my foot. It's a mess. Okay, take the bandages off. It's all over now. You're healed. Take the bandages off. Only baby skin, not even a scar. I could tell you all the miracles that take me all night, but of things we just saw, and one night guy with me, we'd take it in turns. One would 
One would preach, sorry, thank you. One would preach and the other one would then move in words and that night would swap over. So it came my night to move in the gifts. So he preached a good word and I got up and had absolutely nothing. But God's moving. You can always get a few saved, a few filled and different things even if God's not in the house hardly, you know. I mean, we know how to do church. We've got to get to the place where we've got to get to the place that if God doesn't turn up, we're in trouble. But we can do it with or without him now. We know what songs move the crowd and all that kind of thing. We're leaders. Don't look at me like that. It's reality. <laughs> we know how to do it a little bit, you know. I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm talking about how we usher in the presence and all kinds of things. So I, I got nothing. No words. So we had to settle that night for a few salvations, some baptisms, and a couple of little miracles. But that was it. So I was kind of shattered. So I went out after that, went back to the tent, you know, where we're sleeping on the floors in this tent, the beautiful Kent mist coming down on the evening. You're feeling damp and over the field. It's all getting, you know, it's dark now. And just had to spend some time. I said, God... What happened in there? I'd done everything like we'd done it every other night. After lunch, we didn't eat. I rested. I spent time with you, praying, believing some words going in. And I went in and where were you? I mean, this was nothing. Nothing happening. <laughs> nothing. And I just thought the Lord, I don't hear the Lord that clear in some ways. But, you know, other people have heard God say this. I sort of have to reason a little bit. But I sense the Lord was saying to me this. You did nothing wrong. But I need you to understand something tonight. I can pull the rug out from under your feet any time I want to. <coughs> that was the biggest life-changing thing in signs and wonders for me that night. To realize, yeah, he can pull it any time he wants to. But praise God, he says, his gifts are without repentance and revoke and that kind of thing. So we went on and for the next couple of weeks all these things began to happen. But that's how, out of that, some people began traveling down from Maidstone. They were getting touched, then they went back, then they reached out and said, would you come to Maidstone and do something with us, a little group in the, in the doctor's surgery. Then eventually a little church started there, Stephen and Eva went down and it went and now we've got this glorious church there uh, through it all. <laughs> few ups and downs on the journey, but a few things that happen that it's just a wonderful, wonderful expression of what God's about. So I could tell you the stories, the Monday night lives. I meet people all around the world now who said, boy, we went to a Monday night live meeting. People travel from London all around. So the meeting side of it wasn't difficult, but it was that living to where we could live just naturally, supernatural. If a few closing thoughts for you tonight. Signs and wonders and miracles do not necessarily mean one is living naturally supernatural and doesn't necessarily mean you're living in the spirit realm. That's something that we've got to get over. In fact, there were people doing that in Jesus' day and he said, get away, I never knew you. It's possible to do the things. Sometimes people ask me, well, all these moves we've had over times of refreshing around America and other nations and then we read out, oh man, the guy who's doing this also living out of a man cave with all this stuff going on on the side before he goes on the thing. Or all the, How can it possibly be? Well, God's a lot bigger than the gift. That's the reality. And he'll honor people's faith as they're reaching out to him, even if the vessel is as flawed as you can be. That's a sad reality. But there's something why that doesn't have to be the case is because when you live in the spirit realm, not just do spiritual things, but you live in the spiritual realm naturally, then you're walking with people in relationship, accountability, covenant life, all that kinds of stuff, and out of it flows, whether it's in a meeting or on the street or wherever you are. And you live your life expectant in the spirit realm that God is supernaturally working with you. I could tell you stories, as many of you know, we lost a grandson three months ago. One lousy, 
$40 pill loaded with fentanyl. Not another thing in his body. The toxicology came back. Just one $40 pill. And a young kid who was our love and joy who two weeks ago would have turned 21. Three months ago, the day after Marilyn's birthday. Four years before that, went through surgery and ended up, not knowing to us, got addicted to the painkillers that they gave him in the, with the surgery and then brought one that was laced with fentanyl. Hundreds of kids in America where we live dying continually now. I won't go into all that. That's not the thing. But in that, you're not in your highest spiritual moment living through those times. They're rough. They're rough. I remember going into where they had laid his body at the situation and my daughter wanted to go in, my son-in-law didn't. So I went in and, you know, they said to me, do you think you can take it to go in there with Emma? And I looked at Marion, and looked at the others and said, I held her the day she was born, I can hold her one more time. And the whole she just wept, I can't let him go, you know. I mean, it's, these are tough times, you all have them. Some of you have been through them in 23. All kinds of different challenges and battles. Not easy. But in the midst of it, we began to see this weaving of a naturally supernatural kind of life. Because there's one thing I've learned in this over the years. It's this. In the mass of things, you see the big miracles. You see God's greatness. But in the small things, you see his fatherhood. And that's when you live in the spirit realm. You believe good things, blessings are following you. You live from a Macarius man place where you don't live for the blessing, you live from the blessing. And Jesus said to his men that were going to be the ones who were going to build this kingdom with him, he said one of the qualities you're going to have to have in your life is Macarius are you who mourn for you shall be comforted. Why was that one of the conditions of being the kingdom man that was going to... Because grief was going to be part of our life. Absolutely ridiculous to believe that we believe a gospel that hasn't got suffering in it as well. That is the big part of the gospel. Being aligned to that as well as these victories and everything else. But we just began to see as we walk, we live expecting something to happen. We believe life's an adventure even in the darkest of days. Man and I believe that together and we set out on a plane journey. We believe it's a, an adventure. Something good is going to happen. And we, we just saw God breathing on that. I'll give you one little illustration. We felt we should go out to Australia early in the year just to have a break because it had been a tough couple of months and leaders with us had felt we needed just to take some time and just relax a bit and grieve ourselves and walk it through. So we thought, okay, now we'll go. It's a busy month to go to Australia. We felt we should go to Australia for it, be back on familiar ground, go to a place where we didn't really know anybody and contact nobody, just be there for three weeks, except to see Marilyn's sister and her brother for one week of that came up. So we went, so we went to book our air tickets. I love living like this, don't you? Let me tell you the prelude to this first. When we first went down in the Richmond days, we were out in a Chinese restaurant with friends who are very close covenant friends with us today still. Have a bit different belief system than us, but we love the journey together. And we're in a Chinese restaurant, and they looked at us and said, you know, you guys, a day in your life is a life of adventure. Oh, well, I guess it is. You know, we've just come back from somewhere, and uh, locally bound a little bit. So we broke open our fortune cookies. <laughs> and theirs had great ones like go to Vegas and <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Not quite. I don't know what they were. Marilyn breaks hers open and literally we've still got them. She's kept them. It said this, a day in your life is a life of adventure. <laughs> I broke mine open and said a day in your life is a life of adventure. So we said, okay, that's the rest of our life. Every day is going to be a life of adventure. We are spirit beings. We live in a spirit realm. We live in natural bodies, but can't get in the way too much. 
and we're going to believe. So now we're going away for these days. So look up on the air tickets. 3,600 economy tickets to Australia in the height. Now, please don't feel sorry for me. I could have got them. God's my source. And, but would I get them? <laughs> so I said, no, no, I don't think so. That's a bit much, you know. Just for a vacation, you know. I mean, we're going there, but we felt we needed the time. So we're within a week of where we're going to go. I think, no, you know, we'll go to, to an island somewhere or something. So we <coughs> look up again, and I found a flight, 2,000. 600 into Sydney. So, oh, well, that's a little better. So we looked again a day later, and we're going to leave in two or three days, and the tickets come up, $1,800. So I thought, this is great, getting better all the time. Let's keep <laughs> walking this way. Never jump too quick when you, have, when you don't get ahead of God, don't get behind him, you know. It may jump up the next day real quick, so grab them when you've got to grab them. But... United owed, owed us some money, some vouchers that they given had to be used up. And then we had some upgrade certificates, the one to go. So then it came down in price again. So then we said, okay, United, we called them up. You know, we got these vouchers, you need this. So that brought the tickets down to 750. Then our upgrade tickets clicked in. So instead of going $3,600 ticket economy, we went business class with beds there and back for $700 a ticket. <laughs> See? So what is, what is that? I just think it's blessings overtake you. I expect them. I, I, I expect them. We were flying out to South Africa, and we had a little bit of time on the trip. So they make an announcement on the plane uh, before we get on. The plane's oversold like they often do. We need four people to get off and give their seats to someone else. We can't go. So I said to Marilyn, what do you think? She said, well, it's an adventure. Why not? We've got time. Sorry? Oh, yeah, the first leg up to Washington. And then we're going up to New York and out. So he said, it's an adventure. Why not? So we go up to the lady and said, um, OK, we'll put our name on the list. You need four. OK, what are you giving? So she said... We'll give you $700 each if you'll do it. <laughs> so we said, okay, you know, we don't mind how God provides you. Or do you just have him locked into one little channel of economy? So we're sitting there. Then they come up and announce, okay, we don't need those who put their names forward, so everybody's on. So we said, well, that's great. We had a go. We live by the Australian philosophy, have a go, you never know. <laughs> it might work, but it doesn't. Nothing lost. So we're about to go in and give him the boarding pass and this man comes running up wanting to get on the flight. And he, he says, I've got to get on this flight. She said, well, you're too late. It's oversold, you know, all this, it's full. Sorry. He said, I've got to get to D.C. So she looked at us and said, well, what do you guys think? We said, we're fine. We don't mind. Let him go. He's in more hurry than us. So got on. She looked at us and said, okay, I'll give you the money. I said, well, it's got to be worth a thousand now, surely. <laughs> so, she, you know, the Bible says you have not because you ask not, right? I have a one or two anchor scriptures, one or two anchor ones that I switch over a little bit selfishly sometimes. But I said, you know, why not? So she said, you really know the system, don't you? I said, so she said, yeah, a thousand each now. So the funny thing was, they give us $1,000 in vouchers, you know, which were good for a vacation or anything, 1000 each, and we go sit down and wait for the next plane. But then all the people started getting off the plane because there was something wrong with it, <laughs> off the original one. So some of those people who got off started to rebook their tickets on something else, and all it was was one plug that had to be put in, but they couldn't get a guy to do it. So they come back, they put the plug, plug in, and now they take off. So she looks at us, the woman, and said, Four people are off now. You can go on this flight if you want. <laughs> and, but she said, you know, the thousand each is still yours because that's gone all through the system now. We said, oh, we think we'll wait for the next one. And so we waited, had something to eat and went on there. But how do you live? Do you live believing that you're living a life that's just not natural? 
and God can move. Not always does it happen, obviously. But, you know, it started for me living up in New York when we first came. And you know, I remember going to an airport in New York, standing there to fly. I had to go to this place to minister. And it was back in the days where you could peel the tickets off before computers were doing it. And I stood there, it was a small plane, and the guy behind the desk is standing there, and he says, sorry, sir, you can't get on this flight, it's full. And I said, okay, but I really need to be on that flight. And uh, I had a standby ticket, you see. I said, sorry, it's full. So I said, do you mind if I just wait here? So I stood there in front of his desk, and the plane's full. He said, look, I've got no more things to peel off. So I said, I'll just stand here. Then the plane begins to back out of the gate. I'm watching this little plane back out. So I'm still standing there. So he says, what are you standing here for? I said, because I'm going on that plane. <laughs> he says, can't you see it's going to the runway? I mean, I was that far. I was getting embarrassed a little bit by now, you know. <laughs> so I'm still standing there. And I'm, he packs up his little desk and he's walking off. And I'm standing there on my own. Another person in this lounge. And then I see the plane coming back to the gate. <laughs> and I see him scamper down, open it up again. A woman gets off and he says to me, this woman suffered with claustrophobia. She, she was in the back seat. She couldn't stand it on the plane. They had to let her off. So there's a seat on the plane. You can have it if you want. I said, I've already got it. <laughs> you can't give it. I didn't say it this way. But you can't give it to me. The Bible says once you've got it in your faith, you've got it. It's in another realm. I could tell you story after story. It would take me two weeks to tell you the times it didn't work. <laughs> An hour or two to tell you the times it did. You know, it's like... But so many times like that. And Church of the Nations was born in all of that. That's how it happened. That's who we are. Everyone who's been here over years could tell you stories, Tess. I mean, we've got these guys here playing planted a church out on the Falkland Islands after the war. We could tell you stories of the miraculous things they had to do. Move around, do all kinds of things, and just see God supernaturally open doors. But you can never live like it until you come to the place in your life where you believe, first of all, you're a spirit. You have a soul, and you live in your body. And the most natural thing for a spirit man to do is spiritual things. So it's more natural for you to live in a spirit realm than it is for you to live in the natural realm. This is where you're the foreigner. This is where... Not that realm. I love that realm. I get a bit carnal at times and locked into this natural realm like everybody else. Have to shake your head and say, come on. This is not where you live. You're going to step out, your business, your destiny, things you're going to do. It's going to be supernatural. But it's going to be naturally supernatural. Because God already says you're living with him in heavenly places. That's where you're seated. So live from where you are. I have a friend called Ken Gill. Some of you know Ken. But he sends you, if you're sick or something like that, he'll send you a card that says, Keep looking down <laughs> rather than keep looking up. Keep looking down. That will say on the bottom. You're already seated in heavenly places above this thing. Keep looking down at it. <laughs> Remember where you are, who you are. See, our real difficulty in Western culture is that we're natural people that believe in charismatic experiences rather than being spirit people that live in this natural world. And that was the battle Jesus had all the time, was the battle of the realms. The woman at the well, give me some water. If I, you drunk of what I want to give you, you'll never thirst again. Are you more important than Jacob who gave us this well? I can remember the day Dad and I made him. Eventually, hit her. She went running to a village. Because he said to her, Go get me your husband. 
I haven't got one, I know. You had five or six, whatever it was, and the man you shacked up with now is not your husband. She ran to the village and said, come see the man who, showed, who told me everything I've done. On her testimony, half the village got saved and the other half came out to Jesus and got saved. whole area turned around to Jesus because of one word of knowledge. Out of a naturally spirit-filled, spirit life man who was just living in the natural realm. You always live in the combat of the realms when you live there. But if you don't live there, you'll only ever live religious Christianity. And that's our choice. So let's pray together and believe over the next days that others are ministering with you and I'm playing golf. Uh, no, sorry, as I'm here supporting you. No. <laughs> but over the... If you saw me play golf, you know, in that realm, I haven't got into the spirit realm at all yet. It's very natural, very naturally bad. But I just want to encourage you. How do you see yourself? Who are you? Who are you? Where do you live? What's your thought pattern every day? When you see a neighbor, when you walk down the street, you walk into your workplace, how do you see them? You know what I love about guys like Sean Bolts and people like that that move so powerfully in gifts and signs and wonders? Because he said, when I, when I was having lunch with him one day, he was saying, when, I'm, when I see a prostitute in LA or someone I'm working with, when I start to talk to her, I don't see a prostitute. I see a young lady in the finished, complete work of Christ, an image carrier. And when I finished chatting with her, I wanted to be there see the completion in the spirit before and then let it work out from the natural. So Father, I pray for every life here tonight. I thank you that with all our weaknesses and strengths in Church of the Nations all over the years around the world, one thing that's been a thread that's gone through from day one all the way through is we are a supernatural people and we're not ashamed of it. We love the gifts of the Spirit. We love seeing them work. But remember something, just because we operate them doesn't mean, folks, that we're living in the Spirit realm. But if we are living in the Spirit realm, they are the tools that we'll use. And remember always, they're tools, not toys. They're here to set the captives free, bring people, give hope to the hopeless, lift up the downtrodden, give food to the poor, Whatever it is you're going to do, do it naturally, supernaturally. Believe for God to breathe upon it. Let the glory of God rise in your heart. I'd love to pray over you, prophesy over every single person and just believe for God, like we've seen going on the last, the last two or three weeks. We've probably seen as many miracles and things happen in people's lives in the last two or three weeks than we've seen in the last two or three years. Because something fresh is happening. Some people in this room could testify about it. But that's not for tonight. Tonight is just to stir you up and encourage you. This is a good day. You're good people. You're washed in the blood. You've been regenerated. The Holy Spirit is in you. You're spiritual beings, chained a little bit in this natural body. But you, the real you, is made in the image of God. So, Father, I pray for every one. Those who feel a bit downtrodden tonight, those who feel a bit under it, whatever it is that we declared as we were singing tonight, you are who you say that you are. And Father, I pray for every life here over this couple of days to have fresh encounters with you. Those who are carrying father wounds still, those who got need just a touch of your, your power and your presence. God is a family of churches and clusters around the world and that we've got a lot of imperfections. But God, one thing we've got is you. And Father, we just thank you for the increase of that realization. Can I just encourage you guys tonight? You're together, obviously, and I hope you are at least sitting like this. But let me... <laughs> Let me just hold your hands for a minute because I just saw in the spirit just 
and this is not a criticism anyway, a condemnation, but you've lived below your potential. And that's ending tonight. Because you're going to rise into all that, 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 that God has for you. You know, there be many times you felt like a man that when you jump, you hit your head on the ceiling. And, but it's breakthrough time. And don't be concerned. Don't be stressed in it. Just let God naturally, supernaturally walk through you. Because the fresh filling of your spirit that's going to happen even over these days. And it's going to stir things up in you. It's going to stir the gifts up in you in ways beyond what you've known. Because you've hungered for some things. It's time. It's time. But God just lift you into it. It's time. It's just time for many of you. I know if I said those who just want more of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, you know, stand up. We'd all stand up. I'd stand up. Because we, we all want a bit more. But I do believe there are some here tonight that have come really hungering. Not hungering in a false kind of way, but really know that you've been operating below the level God wants you to operate into. You know, some of us were in a, a, a meeting just a couple of weeks ago in another nation, some of us that are in this room. And a, a word came that someone just had their car repossessed. It's a leader's meeting had their car repossessed and eventually this man came forward and we just said in that context I felt God say we need to be specific so what is it and in that country it was in South Africa it wasn't a large amount of money but for him it was a large amount of money and whatever happened with the company or whatever so he said the amount the stuff to do and he just didn't have it and the car got repossessed so we prayed and said God that specific amount that's settled in the spirit realm now we need it manifest in the natural. A man came up right then at the, in the thing and said, wherever it was, his boss or somebody, I can't think who it was, but said, wherever you go now, if you get a specific need that I can meet, just call me and tell me the amount, I'll send it to their account. Made the call, the car was rescued. Just simple things. God's got your deepest concerns on his heart. So if you're here tonight and you know that you're operating, not you just need a fresh touch of the Spirit, but you're operating tonight below the level that you know you're able to operate under in the Spirit and you've let some of this stuff get quenched within you, then I want you just to stand. I want to pray for you that there will be something of the lifting up of God in your inner man tonight that will set you on a place of life and operation.